So purpose and design of pilot RCTs. More controversy. <laughs> <laughs> so we all know that RCTs are the gold standard uh, for research design and medical sciences. And there's lots of guidance on the role, design, conduct, or reporting of full-scale RCTs. There's more books than you can count. There's like Helsinki Declaration, there's consort guidelines, and it just goes on and on and on. But when it comes to pilot RCTs, there's no similar guidance um, about what they should be. Uh, and essentially, kind of organically, there's a traditional perspective, the traditional NIH reviewer perspective, and an alternative uh, perspective. And when you're writing proposals, it's good to be aware of both and because you're going to need to make your case. So um, the traditional expect, uh, perspective, um, so how big should a pilot trial be? Well, if it's too big, then reviewers will tell you it's a definitive trial. And if it's too small, they'll say, well, it's kind of irrelevant. And, 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 and you just had to like thread uh, some kind of a line between this Goldilocksian kind of world. And usually what people ended up with in my experience is that less than 100, but you know, more than 60. And so you just kind of like were in there somewhere. And this was largely to make sure that it was not considered too small and not considered a definitive trial because if you said my pilot samples is going to be 150 people a reviewer for sure is going to say it's a definitive trial and you wouldn't get funded when you're saying those numbers like 50 here are you taking into account that you might be randomizing to two different conditions right i'm i'm yeah i mean i'm i'm pretty much assuming just a two condition thing but 50, 50 per group okay. or you know so that the whole trial would be less than 100, um, not 100 per group. Uh, and so the traditionally, um, you know, mostly I think what people focused on is, well, that logistically, that they could recruit, that they could randomize, and that they could retain. Um, and a lot of times people didn't focus on things like intervention uh, fidelity or participant adherence or burden of assessments in their proposals. It's more like recruitment, the three R's, recruitment, randomization, retention, and then statistics. You wanted to obtain an effect size estimate that you would use to inform the power analysis for your subsequent full-scale RCT. Um, and to some extent, people might talk about preliminary evidence of advocacy. In the alternative perspective, the statistical aspects of this have been removed, and there's more emphasis on all of the logistical aspects so that you're really going to be talking about fidelity monitoring during your pilot trial, and you're going to have a definition of participant adherence uh, to the intervention, and you're going to be looking at that. Um, and so in the alternative perspective, it's all about logistics. So the quote is, it's about our pilot RCTs are about logistics, not statistics. Um, and and the, the really what you know, like, if you have a full scale RCT, it might be stopped because you might have like interim testing. So it might be stopped because of statistical futility. Um, it might be stopped because the interim results suggest efficacy and it's time to stop because you don't need to go further. It could be stopped for safety reasons, um, but it also could be stopped for what's called logistical utility. So the inability to recruit, the inability to randomize, the in inability to retain, the inability to assess is something that, that is so egregious that it's like, you can't even do this. I mean, this is, this is it's time to stop. That's logistical utility and the idea behind an alternative perspective on pilot RCTs is to provide evidence that a full-scale RCT is unlikely to fail because of the 
logistic futility. So why should we avoid obtaining effect size estimates? of precision, fallible decision-making, and equipoise ethics are the three. So most people agree that pilot RCTs are underpowered for tests of group difference. However, NH reviewers in the um, traditional perspective still want effect size estimate in pilot RCTs, but an underpowered study yields unreliable effect size estimates. An under, underpowered study is not going to have a lot of precision uh, or effect size estimates. So here's an example. Say you have two group pilot RCT, 40 per group, 80% retention, end up with N32 per group at the end of the day. Your expected widths of your 95% confidence interval for a group difference, treatment versus control for a continuous outcome the width is a one standard deviation. That's larger than a large effect size. That's huge. Um, with a binary Y, say if the true prevalence is 50% in both groups, and you assume that, say, the, uh, well, then the 95% CI covers intervention group prevalence estimates from 25% to 75%. So you're talking about a span of you know, huge odds, odds ratios. So this is kind of like all you need to know, unless you're willing to have pilot studies that are much larger. This is all you need to know about why you don't try to get effect size estimates from pilot studies. And, but uh, Helena Kramer, and somehow I missed mentioning her paper before. Oh, here it is, a tiny, tiny, tiny font at the bottom. This is the seminal article that basically came out and questioned all of this kind of effect size estimation from pilot studies business in 2006 and really like every statistician knew that pilot studies were too small to get good effect size estimates but everyone also understood that NIH review panels expected that those effect size estimates would be part of the proposal so we were glad to see that article come out to kind of bring some light of the day to it. So, so why would you avoid obtaining effect size estimates from pilot RCTs? One is low power or low precision, excuse me. Um, the other one is fallible decision making. And so this is like where the Kramer article uh, took it a step further. It's very interesting because your pilot study is small, your confidence intervals for your effect size estimates are wide. So it's really possible that you're going to have over or under estimates. And so if your pilot study overestimates the true effect size, then you're going to be emboldened. You're going to assume this larger effect size. You're going to conduct a power analysis for your full scale RCT. You're going to get a too small sample as a result, because you're having a, a big effect means smaller sample required. And then you're gonna have a full scale RCT that's underpowered. Or on the other hand, if your pilot study underestimates the effect size, you're gonna be disappointed. And you're gonna say, oh, I don't have any preliminary evidence of efficacy. And so now I'm not even gonna embark on the full scale RCT. So you end up with this kind of worst of all worlds full-scale RCTs that go into production that are underpowered and potentially some good ideas that never want the pilot studies to show preliminary evidence of efficacy, so they should promise. Um, and that goes against the concept of equipoise. Um, and so this, I stole this slide from Ken Friedland, who's got this amazing slide set about pilot studies. And so this is the, the link to his slide set that you can get. Um, it's really good, but this is this one just kills me. 
because it's it's so right on. Um, you know, the zone of equipoise is where you should be before you start a, a full scale RCT. But what reviewers want you to be is in the zone of enthusiasm. <laughs> and 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 by kind of demanding that pilot studies have produce an effect size estimate or that they produce some preliminary evidence of efficacy, it completely flies in the face of that voice. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it, if you think about it, it's a completely unethical position. It's, it's like, I never thought about it that way, but I was like, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, so, just to summarize the risks of getting effect size estimates from pilot RCT on reliable effect sizes, full scale RCTs that are conducted but underpowered or abandoned, and full scale RCTs that lack equipoise, or at least on the face of the evidence from your unreliable effect size estimates may lack equipoise. Um, but the goal instead is acceptability and feasibility. Um, so it's not about whether the, the full-scale RCT had a good chance of showing a significant outcome, and it's not about efficacy, effectiveness, or safety. Pilot studies are too small to assess safety. Um, but rather, whether or not your full RCT will provide a reasonable test of the intervention, their test. Um, so when I'm writing proposals, I make sure that I make the case for the fact that we are not going after effect size estimates in this pilot study. So I say something like in the blue text. Um, it wasn't until this year that I adopted this approach. Prior to this year, I was still proposing pilot studies that would estimate effect size estimates because I figured that there's a better chance that reviewers were going to side with that position than with uh, the, the alternative position. So that reviewers are expecting effect size estimates. So, you know, um, but I learned earlier this year that NCCIH has actually produced guidance on this. So NC and so it's they've got a whole website on pilot studies, common uses and misuses, and. NCCIH is the only NIH institute that has decided that the debate is over on this and it's time to promote best practice. I have tried to get NIA to follow suit and although they agree with what NCCIH has done, for some reason they are still letting the scientific community debate this issue. And it's kind of like no debate. Um, so, but the fact that NCCIH, I wish it was NCI, uh, and it would be more influential than NCCIH, but um, the fact that you can point to NH guidance in a proposal about this was what made me decide that it was time to switch over. And, uh, and also I know a lot of reviewers, NIH reviewers who always tell me, you know, at the beginning of every proposal review session, I remind everyone that pilot studies are too small. Also, there's lots of reviewers out there who are spreading the word on this. Um, but these two papers are this Kramer paper and the NCCIH uh, guidance is what I would uh, at least, there are other papers, but I would, I would cite those in a proposal. Um, and then what you want to do is, is, is you kind of list all of your feasibility and acceptability outcomes for the pilot. So you kind of have a table or something like this where you talk about screening and recruitment and randomization, fidelity, adherence, retention, et cetera. And you give thresholds for each of these that you're going to use. Um, and then your analysis plan and this is new, so this is going to change. But right now, what I'm doing is descriptive analysis, just descriptive. Um, 
what's happening that's really annoying is that some reviewers are saying things like, yeah, we get that you can't get effect size estimates. And yes, we understand that you don't have power to detect group differences, but I want to see confidence intervals around your feasibility and acceptability thresholds. It's like, what are you talking about? That makes no sense because if I don't have uh, reliable or sufficient precision around an effect estimate, I don't have sufficient precision around acceptability or feasibility threshold value. Um, so that is something that also needs to be addressed head on in the proposal. Um, because I, I, I saw, I've just got a review back where a reviewer said that, made that comment. It didn't make it up to the summary discussion. So might have been shot down in, in discussion. Um, but I also know one NH reviewer who says that her committee always expects to see confidence intervals around these threshold values. Mm -hmm. And I just told her that always shouldn't happen. Understanding of the meaning of what? Threshold. Oh, yes. Wait. Well, you either achieve it or you don't. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. But I mean, you know, there might be some cases where where you might look at a confidence interval in a pilot study, not as not for inference purposes, but just to kind of understand like, like how variable your re recruitment might be across sites or you know, something like that in a more descriptive way. I see an argument about uh, the confidence interval um, I think it sounds, to me, it sounds right because if you don't really have enough sample size for a pilot study, then the accessibility or feasibility, the estimation of that is not really plausible, right? Even so, I, I know this is pilot study, right? Mm -hmm. But how can you judge, right? Why do you need a 50? Why not 100? Why do you need a 100, not 50? think you still need because this your primary end point for pilot study is the feasibility right? right so say the percentage of patients will return in the study right so if you only have like 10 patients then you know then the return uh, retention rate to say 90 percent then your confidence interval will be really wide right so i think that to me it's like uh, provide a precision for the feasibility makes sense i agree with you the for the Efficacies, or I mean, efficacies for the efficacy doesn't really make much much sense here. Well, I think that you, you're 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 just moving. There's a problem of, of lack of precision for effect size estimates. There's going to be a similar problem of lack of precision for your feasibility and acceptability thresholds. So you get double. So it's just, I mean, you're just you. you you can, yeah, I agree with you that you, what you're going to have to do as a pilot study investigator is make sure that you hit your thresholds because that's what you're going for. And it's not, if you try to power or have a big enough sample uh, in your pilot study so that you're going to have nice, tight confidence intervals for your feasibility and acceptability outcomes you're going to end up way beyond the pilot study size. What is your lowest allowance of feasibility? So for example, if you expect your retention rate is 70%, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't want the retention rate as low as to 30%. Right. Right. So I think you need it. You want to have large sample size, I mean related, not really like that large, and then the low confidence interval, low amount of confidence interval is bigger than the like thirty percent. I think if you are going to propose a full scale RCT and 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 you're going to say in that that you've got at least seventy percent retention, that you're going to need a pilot study that shows at least seventy percent retention. Need to hit your marks, otherwise, no one's going to have 
trust that you can do it. That's my take on it. Um, so, yes, so in my opinion, <laughs> and this is all pretty new, and it's going to change with experience, um, but basically you just make subjective judgment claims for sample size, because if you get into precision, you're just back where you were sizes. You're talking about just coming up with some rationale for your size? You just say, your I'm going to get 40 people per group. And I'm doing this because I think that's big enough. <laughs> how else are you going to do it? That's my question. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. I mean, I'm willing to learn otherwise, but the thing is you made this big argument about why you're not going to be statistics and then you have to own that you have to own it you have to say I'm not doing inferential statistics here if you get back into the inferential statistics game they're just going to drag you back in and say well why weren't you doing this for effect size estimates so how do you find effect size estimates I was a plan to <laughs> <laughs> how to choose an effect size estimate <laughs> So, the, um, so what Helena Kramer at all said is you should really be looking at clinically important differences, sometimes called minimum clinically important differences, sometimes called clinically meaningful differences. And, you know, for a lot of our outcomes, we don't have those. Um, and so, if you are, say, proposing an R34, might consider as part of your R34 activities, having, you know, get some stakeholder patient panels, etc., cetera, um, clinician panels, policy groups to help you define a clinically important difference. Um, something along those lines is probably uh, something to consider. Um, of course, depending upon your review group, you might get away with benchmark thresholds, standardized effect sizes, you know, odds, I can detect an odds ratio of two. That's pretty good kind of arguments. Um, I mean, I think you always need to show that the, the, the effect sizes that you can detect are going to be clinically meaningful and that, you know, you don't want to have so much power that you're able to detect something so small that no one cares about. Um, but you don't also want to have only the ability of detecting huge things. So I think it always plays a role that's kind of clinical meaningfulness, always plays a role whether or not you have a definition of a clinically important difference. Um, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Some review groups don't have a problem with standardized effect sizes. Some reject them. Um, so, I think part of your study planning for in some circumstances is going to be creating a definition of a clinically important difference that you can, you know, obviously reviewers can argue against that, but if you have enough uh, kind of stakeholders involved in that process, I've never done it. It's not an easy process. Have tried and been frustrated with it because people don't always agree. Um, so it's it's new territory. Um, so just some resources, uh, papers to get. This this bottom one is this Friedland um, slide set that I referred to before. It's uh, really excellent. Here's some fidelity monitoring. I don't know how much people are into fidelity monitoring in the clinical trials. Linda Borelli is kind of the queen of that, um, and here are some um, publications for that. So that's the end. More questions? Um, could you
go back to your pilot slide that had the checklist kind of a oh. randomization feasibility. Yes. That one. I, I like to think about this as um, just making sure that, especially like you might have multiple centers, mm -hmm. can, can all the centers achieve these benchmarks in a timely manner? Or perhaps that if they cannot, that center should not be involved in the study going forward. Mm -hmm. So our preliminary achievement um, challenges, right. you know, to make sure that you're ready to roll. It's kind of a training period and um, evaluation. Right. So I don't see it statistically like you. I don't right. see it as a statistical exercise. I see it as screening, screening of centers, screening of personnel and their readiness to engaged in the RCT. Yeah, the, I think the Friedland uh, slide set talks a little bit about multi-center trials. And if I'm remembering correctly, it could have been some other article I read that, you know, does your pilot study really lead to engage multiple centers, multiple sites? Um, or can you get away with pilot study conducted in one site when you're having with, for an eventual multi-site trial. Um, and it's, you know, I think it would help to have more than one site at least um, to be convincing, but it's a, definitely an extra wrinkle and it's, it, it, you know, it may drop you out of R21 range um, for that kind of, you really get multi-site. Or clusters at another level, like multiple PCPs for right. other deliverers who might vary in their style and introduce right. you know, heterogeneity. Yeah, it's a whole other kind of issue is like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to say that I can't estimate effect sizes, but am I going to say, can I estimate intra-provider correlation? Or, you know, it's like, probably shouldn't say that in a proposal because shoot you down and you're saying I don't have precision here but I'm, I'm going to use that point estimate uh, there but there is this whole question about when you're piloting or when you're trying to plan for your power analysis for full-scale RCT you're probably going to need intercluster correlation estimates as well and, uh, but there you can make some conservative choices at least that intro provider correlation of 0.10 is usually conservative in most cases. So. But it is another, it's another issue. Turned everyone into a zombie. I was on a study no, section no, where they I shot down the, the time attention mesh control for a few years ago. Wow. Yeah. So. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, I would say it's more, more I've you've incurred a sense of anxiety, at least in me, because I sit there and I think that, you know, so many of the panels reviewing R34s just have a fix it, fixed view of what you're supposed to do, is that yep. you're supposed to show evidence, preliminary evidence of efficacy. And then if you don't have that, you go on to an R01 and you don't have preliminary evidence of efficacy, they won't fund you because you don't have that. I mean, they're not, I agree with you, the idea about equipoise, you know, we ought to, that makes sense, but that's not how reviewers are doing at these days. Yeah, and I think that that's why I, like I said, I changed my tune when I saw the NCCIH guidance, because I can say this is, you know, this is NIH saying what research best practices are, and Reviewers can disagree with that, and they can say, I don't care what NCCIH says, uh, because I don't get funding from the NCCIH, but it was enough to tip the scales for me. And plus, I know that more and more people are waking up to this Kramer article, and so uh, I hear more and more just from my colleagues around campus that, that this issue has been discussed in their 
the community. Mm. So I think it's rapidly changing yeah. review culture around this. To go to the other direction, have you heard very often that proposals are nixed because th they're proposing a definitive trial as a pilot? Well, if you don't make it clear that your pilot is a pilot, reviewers will ding you saying things like, it's not clear if this is supposed to be a definitive trial. Or some reviewers will make it to the news and trial and others will make it to pilot, either because they didn't read it carefully or because. Well, I'm thinking you like in an R34 and you have just so much power, you know, maybe you're doing 150 or something like that. Does it, have you heard much that people, reviewers come back and say too much, too many people? If, if you, yeah, I think it's fairly common if you have a sample size, it's a total sample size of 150 in a pilot study, that you're going to have to really defend that as a pilot, like directly defend that as a pilot, um, because reviewers are likely to say that it's too big for a pilot, and they won't like that, for sure. And that's why this whole dance about, like, what's the sample size of the, in the, in the traditional, um, it was kind of, on the job training, figuring out what reviewers thought a pilot study sample size should look like. I mean, I've had it past where we had qualitative data that were very supportive of going forward. Um, and that passed, but it was also based on previous studies that had shown it, this particular intervention to work. I'm not sure I would suggest doing qualitative instead of some quantitative, at least at an R34 stage. Well, you need to have some quantitative just to show feasibility. So you need to collect the measures. So what happens a lot of times is people think, well, you're collecting all the clinical endpoints in your pilot study. That must mean that what you're doing is going to have estimated effect size estimate. And so you just need to be really clear that this the reason why you're collecting these it, these measures is because of feasibility and acceptability. You need to have the same measurement protocol in pilot study that you do in the trial. Are the measures tolerable? Will people, you know, complete them without complaining, um, et cetera. So yeah, that is another thing that comes up. It's, it's scary, though. I think what Susan's saying, though, that you're going to, they're going to ask you for this data, and then if you don't have effect size that's like it's towards that part of the that grid, then they're going to. Isn't that a phase two trial? Yeah, I think that's a pilot. I think that's a phase two. You're going to feel like the evidence, your scientific well, premise isn't there. It, it does depend on your review group because some review groups are really they're like. Minimum clinically important difference. That's what I want to know. I don't care what your pilot study says or anything. I don't want, you know, these empirically derived, I want clinically important differences. Whereas others would be more likely to want to know about pilot study, empirically derived excise estimates. But I think when you go to your R01, you just need to explain that your pilot study came from the orientation of you know, what the NIH is now pushing as best practices. And so your power is determined elsewhere. And your effect size is determined elsewhere. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's one of those areas where there's the culture is changing. And so knowing exactly what to do. I mean, we so just got back a K, so one of my mentees, got her K critiques back. And this is a resubmission. The original submission was last year, and we proposed to get effect size estimates from our pilot study. That was part of her K. And then the reviewers had a lot of kind of questions about the kind of pilot study procedures that were kind of hard to address. And at the same time, we got this NCCIH guidance. So we just decided 
or a resubmission to completely change gears, which is like completely change gears unless the reviewers ask you to change gears. So, we, but we just decided, forget it. We're gonna we're gonna cite NCCIH. We're gonna say nope. Before we were wrong. Now we're aware of this NIH guidance. We're gonna go for feasibility and acceptability, and the reviewers love it. I mean, they love that aspect of it. I don't know if this got a good score. We'll see if it gets funded. But um, I was really concerned about switching the kind of motivation for the pilot study in a race of mission. But on balance, it seemed like the right thing to do at the end of the day. Because they were all happy with the effect size estimates to begin with. And then, but they were totally happy with the changes we made. So they bought it completely. 